Um, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to Politics and Prose. I'm uh, Brad Graham, the co-owner of the bookstore, along with my wife, Lisa Muscatine, and we have a, a great program for you this afternoon featuring journalist and author David Hoffman talking about his new book, Give Me Liberty, the true story of Oswaldo Paya and his daring quest for a free Cuba. Uh, David's a longtime journalist with the Washington Post, uh, where I got to know him when we overlapped a number of years ago. Uh, his abilities to ferret out information, identify what's most important, put it in very readable form, and tell a compelling story were exemplary then and remain on display today. He's had an impressive run at the Post, serving stints as a White House reporter, State Department correspondent, Bureau Chief in Jerusalem and Moscow, Foreign Editor, Assistant Managing Editor, and in recent years, Contributing Editor and Member of the Editorial Board. He's also proven himself an immensely talented author of nonfiction books. His first three drew on, drew on his expertise on uh, Russia and East-West relations. The Oligarchs, published 20 years ago, chronicles six men who accumulated great wealth and power capitalizing on the uh, unraveling of Soviet communism. The Dead Hand, which won a Pulitzer, delved into the terrifying doomsday competition between the United States and Soviet Union. And the Billion Dollar Spy told the engrossing story of a Soviet radar expert who funneled incredibly valuable secrets to the CIA from the late 1970s into the mid-1980s. In Give Me Liberty, David shifts regions but the story still involves a consequential and inspiring struggle against authoritarian rule. This time, the setting is Cuba, and the focus is on Oswaldo Paya, who became a leading voice of opposition to Fidel Castro's dictatorship. He launched the Varela Project, a citizen initiative that gathered thousands of signatures to petition for democracy, and he sought to build a united front of democratic resistance. Paya died in a mysterious car crash a decade ago this month. David's account of his life is not only an extensively researched tale of one heroic individual's resistance, courage, and persistence, but also, as a Washington Post reviewer put it, the story of a country and its suffocating struggle for freedom. In conversation with David will be Michael Abramowitz, another former colleague of ours from the Washington Post, Mike spent 23 years at the paper, serving for a time as national editor and then White House correspondent. He left journalism 13 years ago to join the Holocaust Memorial Museum and lead its uh, genocide prevention efforts and later its public education programs. Five years ago, Mike became president of Freedom House, whose mission is to advocate, uh, advocate for political freedom and human rights. So please join me in welcoming David Hoffman and Mike Abramowitz. Thank you, Brad, and it's great to be here. I sort of felt I was in the uh, Post newsroom circa 1995, just recently. Uh, anyway, welcome, everyone. Uh, let me just say it's a true honor to be with David Hoffman who I regard as one of the great journalists of our generation. I always think of David when I first came to the Washington Post in 1985, and he was covering Ronald Reagan as kind of a 20-something, right? You were incredibly young. He's gone on to great things, and I think he's really, of, of, of all the great journalists at the Washington Post, he's really respected as someone who is deeply committed to the facts and telling stories. So great to be with you. And I also think it's an auspicious time to be talking about Oswaldo Paya, we're in the middle of what you might call a period of authoritarian resurgence. And so Cuba, after the Cold War, uh, was kind of became an outlier, right? And more countries became free, the, 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 uh, the, the Berlin Wall fell, but now it seems uh, more countries are moving in the direction of Cuba. So I think the story of Oswaldo Paya is, is very uh, relevant to current time. So let's just start with a very simple question. Paya has been described as the Cuba's Václav Havel, their Sakharov. Uh, tell us who he was. Uh, Mike, great for you to be here and great to see all of you. I didn't pack the house, but I do want to say thanks to Brad and Lissa 
This is the third book of mine uh, to be introduced to politics and prose, and I especially want to single out the important force in my life, and I uh, just have to thank her because she continually told me this was the next book I had to do, and I didn't speak Spanish, and I had to force myself from Russia into a whole new uh, world of problems. Oswaldo Paya, if you met him, if he was here today, would not strike you as some kind of a radical. He was a very soft-spoken fellow, and he had kind of the appearance of a teacher or maybe even a priest. He had a lot of ideas. He spoke constantly. He, people said he just wouldn't stop talking. Um, he loved to talk about his ideas, and he had never lived in a free country. He was born in 1952. For the next seven years, Cuba was a dictatorship. And after 1959, for the rest of his life, he, he never lived in a state of liberty. But liberty lived in his mind. And through that experience as a young man, uh, he came to the conclusion something was wrong in the place where he lived. He was uh, part of a big Catholic family. Four generations of this family had uh, grown up in this particular parish church in Havana. Catholics were marginalized in Castro's revolution. Um, they were discriminated against. And sometimes, you know, people threw eggs and stones at them as they walked to church on Sunday. Oswaldo Paya began to ask himself, what's wrong? Uh, 1965, when he was just really 13 years old, his father's business was confiscated. It was a, a business distributing newspapers and publications to all the kiosks and hotels and places around Havana. One day, the militia just marched in and took it over. They took the keys to the cars. He said, what's wrong with this country that they can take away? His father then, that day, hauled off to prison for a week. Why? Because Fidel Castro did like small businessmen or capitalism. And as Paya grew older and older, he said, I have to do something about th what I see all around me. And at first, he turned to the church, and then later, just to activity on his own. But the important thing about his dissidence is it didn't come from some textbook. He wasn't inspired by some famous philosopher, although he tried to learn and read about them. He was driven by what he saw in his real day-to-day -day experience on the streets of Havana. Well, first of all, uh, thank you for that. That's an excellent overview. And I will say I have personally read this book, so I can highly recommend it. So, uh, but, but let me just say, uh, tell us a little bit about the Varela Project, which was his kind of major initiative and that for which he became uh, most known for. Um, how did he think of it? What was it? And, and how, did he, how did he get this idea in his head of collecting all these signatures to challenge Castro? Just imagine yourself having the courage and the, the inspiration and the stamina to go up against the police state, to challenge personally a totalitarian system. What would it take? We know people that have done this sometimes with a rhetorical flourish, you know, they issued a press release or gave a speech or something. But Oswaldo Paya concluded that nothing was going to change if he didn't do something more than just a press release, that he had to act. And very, very few people living in a dictatorship have the wherewithal to act. Well, he tried a lot of things over the years. We can discuss some of them, trial and error. And frankly, a lot of them didn't work. Police states are powerful. They have spies in every corner. People are arrested. He tried twice to run for parliament. He never even got on the ballot. They, Police came and hustled him away and said, sorry, you can't do that. He tried smudgy handbills, and people snapped up the handbills, but of course, uh, he was told he had to stop doing that. He tried once writing a 46-page plan for Cuba's transition to democracy. I mean, this guy had ideas spilling out of his head. You know, even at night, he was sitting in bed with a board and a, piece, a pencil and paper writing out his ideas. People were not moved by the transition plan to democracy. He had to do something else. So out of years of frustration, finally, in the early 1990s, Cuba fell into a terrible economic distress. The Soviet collapse left the country, people literally hungry, uh, uh, very, very hard times, and looking for answers. And he thought, I have to do something that people will grasp, something simple, 
and something that will get results. And so he came up with the idea that to use a long forgotten provision in the Cuban Constitution that allowed for a citizen initiative. In other words, if 10,000 people would sign a petition for a law or for change and submit it to the legislature, it could be done. No one had ever tried doing it in Fidel Castro's dictatorship out of fear. Oswaldo Pio had the genius to realize that this was actually a legal petition. The Constitution allowed it. And as he began to collect signatures, he told people, get over your fears. This is legal. It's in our Constitution. We can use the laws of the state against itself. It was an incredible lever to begin to challenge the dictatorship, which had never submitted itself to a, a real free and fair election, had never really asked people to vote. Payaz's action drew thousands in, of signatures. It wasn't easy. It took several years. But people got the point that they have a right to rights. So the brilliance of the Varela Project, which was this petition, was that it was legal and turned the weight of the state against itself, and people stood up to be counted. On this petition, you didn't only sign your name. People put their address, and they put their identification number. And Oswaldo Pio's teams verified it three times. In other words, people stood up to be counted. They were not hiding. And 35,000 people did this in Castro's dictatorship, which is a remarkable thing in a place that gave people absolutely no public space for their own, to articulate their own views. So what happened? One day he just showed up at, at the parliament or at the uh, president's office and just threw a bunch of... No, it uh, wasn't that how, how did it work? It wasn't that simple because, as you can imagine, uh, Castro's secret police started to keep an eye on him. He was in their crosshairs. They had already arrested him a few times. Sometimes they, when he was riding his bike home from work, a truck would show up and run him off the road. They would frequently, come, the secret police would come up to him on the street and say, you won't live longer than Fidel. And Fidel was 80 years old. So he was under a lot of pressure all the time. But they miscalculated because the secret police, the state security in Cuba, thought that maybe Oswaldo Pio, like the other dissidents, had only a few hundred people on his signatures. They didn't realize that thousands and thousands, and Oswaldo took the signatures, he copied them on an old photocopier, but he hid the originals so that nobody could seize them or burn them or destroy them. And he hid them by giving them to the nuns who put them in convents around the island. And at the last day, when they were ready to submit them to the assembly, they all brought them to Havana. They had them in a box. And the next morning, state security had microphones in the rooms. They were listening to everything Oswaldo was saying and to his assistants. And he said to them, we're going to submit these in just a few more days. But then he handed them a piece of paper. What year are we talking about now? 2002. Yeah. May of 2002. He said to the microphones a couple of days, but he handed out to his, everybody on his team a piece of paper. It said, tomorrow morning, 10 AM. So they surprised Fidel by rushing the first 11,020 signatures to the National Assembly and plopping them on the desk and getting a receipt um, on that day, May, May of 2000. And what were they demanding in the, in the documents? The and, how did, and how did the, and how did the, and how did the regime respond? The, the Varela Project had five simple demands. Paya had spent years thinking about this, and he realized if you ask for 10 things, it's probably too many. So he boiled it down. And the petition called for freedom of speech, freedom of association, freedom of the press, freedom for political prisoners. Political prisoners were a stain upon Cuba. Everybody knew people that had been thrown into jail just for their views. Free enterprise, the right of people to have their own businesses, and freedom to worship as you choose. So in the end, it also called for a referendum that would lead to 
elections and uh, a new system, a new electoral system, a uh, democracy. This was a petition for democracy in the middle of a dictatorship. And 20 years later, we still don't have a democracy there. So, so what did, you asked me, what did Fidel Castro do with all this? Yeah, what, what did he do with all this, and how can you call this a success if he just kind of threw it in the, in the trash, or how did he respond? You just took my punchline. <laughs> Fidel Castro threw them in the trash bin. And he waited a little while through 2002. Oswaldo Paya was awarded the Sakharov Prize for Freedom of Thought, which is one of the great human rights prizes in the world. And when he came back from collecting that, Castro rounded up all of his associates and threw them in prison. 75 people were arrested, about 48 of them worked directly on the Varela project. The others were journalists and activists. So that was Castro's answer, which was more dictatorship. But he never threw Paya in jail. You know, it's a good question why Paya wasn't arrested in jail then. And I think one answer is that he had just collected this prize. He'd been nominated for a Nobel Prize, formally nominated. And I think maybe Castro had something else in mind. Because Castro's secret police were trained by the East German Stasi. And part of that training involved how to disrupt people with, and how to wreck their lives, to smear them, to pressure them without actually arresting them. How to persecute people silently. And this is the method they chose for Oswald the Uh Going back to the question I sort of was hinting at a little bit earlier, how do you assess his impact then if, you know, all his associates are arrested, he was kind of marginalized within Cuban society, uh, they didn't do what was required under the Constitution and take his demands seriously. So uh, you've written a big book about him. Why, why do you consider that a success? Why do you consider that something significant? One of the things that Pyle realized from the time he was a boy was that if you're going to challenge a powerful totalitarian system like this, and it was totalitarian, Fidel Castro's single party, single control over the, the news media, over all forces of state security, singularly controlled the economy. If you're going to challenge something like that, you have to lose your fear. The Castro system had a, literally informers in every apartment building, in every block throughout the whole island. 50,000 people were just there to snitch on people. So there was a lot of fear. And one of the things that happened with the Varela project is that Paya was successful in leading people to get over their fears. And by signing that petition and by standing up and saying, we're for this, he broke through where other people had not been able to. Well, let me make, let, ask the question a different way. You know, a number of the other countries, which, by the way, you reported on, David, you know, Russia, I mean, Soviet Union, uh, uh, East Germany, uh, they became, to a certain extent, free after the fall of the Berlin Wall. And why did Cuba not follow suit? Why was Fidel successful in kind of holding on to power? And why did someone like Payaz plea, which was so powerful, uh, not in the end succeed in actual political change? You know, I use this word totalitarian and I had to look it up myself to find out the history of it. Totalitarianism as a word to describe this kind of system really got started with Mussolini. And you know the experience of World War II of that kind of a structure of a police state that controlled everything uh, was something that Castro actually was rebelling against when he overthrew Batista, who was a dictator in Cuba, in 1959. Fidel Castro had promised he was going to build a democracy, a beautiful, pure democracy, he said. And of course, within a short period of taking power, he, he didn't do that. So I think one of the things is that these structures, Castro had enormous numbers of people devoted to the secret police, to being informers. These powerful dictatorships aren't, don't easily come apart. And what happened in Eastern Europe is actually sort of a miracle 
those uh, societies could have been under the boot much longer. I don't think it was uh, foreordained that the Berlin Wall was going to fall in 1989 or the Soviet Union collapse uh, two years later. But it is true that Poland, Czech Republic, inside the Soviet Union, there were forces afoot. Things were falling apart. People were actually very, very dissatisfied. The spirit and uh, of those revolutions that had first brought communism a long ago have been forgotten. And we see some of that stagnation now in Cuba. We see the exact same kind of stagnation. And that's why a lot of people feel there's really a question how long the Castro revolution can continue. It's now been 63 years. It's where the Soviet Union was in 1980. How much gas was left in the Soviet Union in 1980? David, let me ask you a question that I, uh, if I could just switch gears a little bit. One of the things that's kind of interesting uh, in your book was to kind of learn about how kind of the Cuban exile community, particularly in the United States and South Florida, was a little bit skeptical of Paya. Um, I mean, one thing that's quite interesting about Paya is he never left Cuba except for that one trip to collect the Sakharov Prize. And I think he came to Washington on that trip once and met some people here. But he was always inside Cuba. Uh, what was the, wh why was the, why, why were the traditional kind of anti-Castro groups in, in the United States more, more kind of skeptical of him? The Cuban exile community, especially in Miami, has a very, very strong views forged over their own experience uh, of exile. And those views basically always uh, looked upon anything in regard to Castro as black or white. And essentially said, we can't even contemplate any kind of dealings with him. We can't negotiate anything. He must go. And as a result, people on the island who ventured out into the street against the system uh, you know, it was a tough thing. It was one thing to be on your soapbox in Florida enjoying freedom of speech and the American way. It was another thing to actually confront Castro from the streets. So when the Varela project got going, when Oswaldo Pyle was doing this, people in Florida said, oh, he wants to use the existing Constitution. He must be a collaborator. He must be soft on Fidel. Pyle must just be another one of these ineffective people in Cuba who would like to tweak the system. They misunderstood Paya completely. And part of the Varela project happened during the conflict over Elian, the young boy uh, who uh, found alive after that terrible uh, boat sinking. And that moment was uh, actually uh, crystallized this conflict that I talked about into black or white. It was an enormous fight between Castro and the Miami Cubans. And the Miami Cubans lost. And Elion went back to the island. And so there was a great deal of bitterness. And in the, in the middle of that, people didn't see this guy going door to door in Cuba with a citizen petition getting people to sign signatures. But Fidel Castro was actually much more worried about Oswaldo Paya than he was about the Miami Cubans. And his legitimacy was on the line. And when he realized that 35,000 people had done this, that, that put Paya in the position of enemy number one. Did he eventually win them over? Did, 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 did Paya eventually kind of convince some of these people that he was serious? He, uh, Oswaldo Paya made one trip to Miami in 2003. Uh, he spent a couple of days tr tr you know, trying to break through the misunderstanding. Um, some of the hardline uh, Cubans in Miami took out a newspaper ad criticizing him while he was there. But others who had been his critics listened to him and their views changed. Um, uh, you know, the Black Spring, the moment in which Fidel arrested all 75, followed this only by weeks. Mm -hmm. And again, you could see that Castro was in no mood to give Oswaldo Paya even an inch. What, what did Paya think of the uh, embargo, and what did he think about the, you know, the policy of isolation by, conducted by the United States since the Kennedy administration? You know, it's very, very common for us to have 
a discussion about Cuba that comes back to whether we can solve this problem in Cuba. And the United States has had a trade embargo on Cuba for s six decades. And the question always comes up, you know, what about this trade embargo? The Cubans, of course, have uh, been objecting to it for six decades. And the Miami Cubans have been standing saying we have to do it. But Paya said something very wise about it. He said, lifting the embargo is not going to bring democracy to Cuba. Keeping the embargo is not going to bring democracy to Cuba. The only way we're going to get democracy in Cuba is if we, the Cubans on the island, and others in the diaspora, ask for it and go out there ourselves and demand it. It's not about the embargo. It's about us. One of the most powerful parts of the book is the ending in which you talk about his death. And I want to encourage everyone here to buy the book and, and to find out for yourself. But let me just ask you point blank. Do you believe that he was murdered by the regime? Oswaldo was still campaigning even after all of his people had been thrown in prison and, some of, and then released. He was still trying to get something like the Varela Project going. And he had a long car trip all the way across the island on Sunday, July 22nd, 2012. Driving the car were two foreigners, one from Spain and one from Sweden, young democracy activists who had come to help him. Their whole trip was around trying to help him. When they were very close to Santiago de Cuba, after having been in the, in the car maybe 10 hours, they were approached from behind. The car behind them rammed their vehicle. It wasn't a head-on crash. It was actually a shove from behind, but it caught caused the Spanish fellow who was driving the car to lose control. The car spun across gravel and according to the Cuban version, hit a tree and Oswaldo Payal was killed. I'm not so sure he was killed at that moment, but by, the, by nightfall he was dead. They caused that wreck by hitting the car from behind. They caused the driver to lose control. And who, was in, the car, and who was in the car that was nudging? Do we know that? We don't. There are, uh, there are unknowns. We don't know who drove the car that hit them. We don't know why they d chose that particular moment. We don't really know how Oswaldo died, whether there was a car crash against a tree or somebody hit him on the head. But we know that by nightfall, he was dead. Uh, a protege of his, Harold Sapero, who was also in the car, was killed. And the two foreigners were alive and in the hospital. There are a lot of questions, but I think indisputably, they were rammed from behind by a car that had state, had government license plates. I'm going to ask a couple more questions, but I think we're approaching the point where people can, you know, start lining up, I think, and uh, if you have questions. But uh, the story of his death actually calls to mind uh, a question about methodology here. Uh, you know, you were someone who had covered U.S. government, foreign policy, had covered uh, uh, Eastern Europe, the Middle East, but you had never really covered Latin America, I believe. So, number one, can you tell us how you came to write this book? Uh, I think it's an interesting story. And also, tell us a little bit about what it was like to actually report this book uh, when, you know, some, so many of the witnesses and the people who knew him are, are in a, living in what you correctly describe as a totalitarian state. So when I was foreign editor of the Post and Mike was the national editor, I heard the story of the Varela Project and one of our correspondents went to Cuba and wrote a story about Oswaldo Paya. And it was kind of a head scratching moment. I was the editor, we published a story, but I thought, wait, a democracy petition in a dictatorship? It was a story about the Varela Project. Yes, that was 2002. Uh, some years later, I had just started on the editorial board of the paper, and I was the junior member, even though I had gray hair. I was definitely the newest member. And so at the editorial board meeting one Monday, um, the Monday after Oswaldo was dead, I was searching, thinking up what could I offer to the board that they would agree to write. And I said, I think this guy was pretty brave. He must have been. I remember that petition. I'd like to write an editorial about him. And this began a whole series of editorials, which we demanded an investigation into the car wreck, which, by the way, we never got from the Cuban government. So I continued to write about it. I got to know his family. And for several years, I asked them 
if, if they would help write a book. And it was a very traumatic time for them. All of them, the family came to Miami, um, left Cuba behind, uh, and finally in 2017, um, they agreed. And one of the things I discovered uh, was that Oswaldo's widow, Ophelia, had brought out of Cuba a large amount of his writings. And he loved to talk, and he also loved to write. Um, all of this was scratched out a lot of it in pencil and ballpoint pen on pieces of paper that had to be translated and read and scrutinized. But there was an enormous amount of material of his thoughts and of, of what had happened over these years to work with. Everybody who worked with him, all those 75 who went to prison, they were all exiled. So none of them are left in Cuba. Most of them are now in Miami, although some went to Madrid originally. I interviewed them. Um, Carol and I then went to Cuba because we wanted to see the street where he grew up on. We wanted to go to the Capitolio, the, the capital of Cuba, where the Constitution had been written. The 1940 Constitution was the one that had that provision I mentioned, about 10,000 signatures. So I, I did go there, but frankly, the, everybody the in the, the story. Cuba, did the Cuban authorities knew, know what you're up to? You ask them. I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is that I wanted to see and feel it for myself, but the people had all fled and they were here. But I did do a lot of interviews for the book, uh, and I also tried to look at the records. The Cubans had a trial after the car wreck of the Spaniard who was driving. And in the trial, they covered up the fact that the car was rammed from behind. And so I wanted to understand whether they had ever recorded this, and it was completely whitewashed. And does Ophelia still live in Havana? No, she lives in Miami. Okay, so the whole family's out of, the whole out, family is out of Cuba, out. which is interesting since he never wanted to leave. This was a very big family. Uh, one of us, all those brothers told me, he said, there was a time when if you went to our parish church, if you went to catechism classes, payas were half of, the, half of the church. There were dozens of them, and it was a big, sprawling uh, family. Now, he said, the only payas left in Cuba are in tombs. David, and by the way, please, if, if people have any questions, please come up to the microphone. There's a, and microphone, there's here. a microphone right here, and uh, we'd be happy to take questions. Um, I, I, I thought it might be interesting to reflect a little bit about the larger meaning of his life. Uh, you know, as I alluded to at the beginning of this, we're in this kind of authoritarian resurgence, and I think really in the last two years, particularly if you think of what's happening in Myanmar, Belarus, Hong Kong, China, uh, Russia. Russia, Russia in particular, there's an incredible, uh, really, assault on, on people like Paya. Uh, it, it really, uh, not just imprisonment, but surveillance, uh, all sorts of tactics. It's just almost impossible for some of these people to, to operate uh, where they, once, where they mon once might have operated. So. Have you reflected upon if there's any lessons from uh, uh, Paya's life that might be ap applicable to the current situation? It's an issue you and I have talked about a lot. Like, what do you actually have to do to overthrow an authoritarian regime? Not easy. No, it's not. I have some friends in Belarus, and they had an underground theater to fight the dictatorship there. They would put on these plays. They would never announce them. They would just have them in somebody's living room or a garage or a warehouse. But uh, completely underground, and the authorities chased and chased them. And for years, they did this. And finally, recently, they had to flee. They couldn't keep it up anymore. And it's like Paya and his citizen petition. We think of, oh, just another petition. Somebody comes to the door. We don't really see how subversive that was. But in his case, mobilizing people to sign something for democracy uh, was really, really challenging to Castro. And we see in Myanmar now, People who for 25 or 30 years have championed the idea of nonviolent protests are now turning to violent resistance because it's the only way they can fight for their rights. And Oswaldo was fearful of this. Paya said often that Tiananmen Square massacre had deeply, deeply worried him that could happen in Cuba too, that a regime back to the corner might just open fire on demonstrators. He says, we cannot get liberty through bloodshed. But 
everywhere that Michael's just mentioned, all over the world, people are carrying out this fight, and in Ukraine, especially given their lives, shedding blood for these ideals that he held. And there are not easy uh, methods. There's not a toolkit you can buy on Amazon to fight totalitarianism. But I hope if you read the book, you'll see that Oswaldo brought a lot of inspiration and thought to what's happening literally today all over the world. I think this idea of kind of turning the regime's own rules against itself seems potentially interesting on a broader scale. But uh, in this case, it was very useful in mobilizing people. People liked, and they, they agreed with him, they would sign for it. But in the end, the regime itself refused to accept the, ru the rules and tore it up. Sir. So it happens I grew up in a communist uh, country and I know that the repression there was uh, probably much worse than what is in Cuba right now so there was no such a thing as writing uh, collecting signatures and so on so I grew up in Romania for me and then in Romania the the communists fell uh, uh, because of a revolution it's right that there's lots of help from outside uh, I kept on waiting for the last 20 years for these guys in Cuba to revolt, to go in street and to, to whatever, to make a, a, a violent revolution like in Romania and to get rid of these guys. Uh, how come it doesn't happen? It did. It happened last July 11th. I don't know if you paid attention. Uh, last July 11th, 100,000 Cubans spontaneously went into the street demanding liberty, mm -hmm. shouting protests, demanding democracy, and many of them were holding up their hands like this in an L, which was Oswaldo Payaz's signature mm -hmm. for liberation. I they didn't get it, but they're asking for it. Okay. All right, Ale, we have, a, we have a ringer here, the head of Latin America program for Freedom House. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for this book. For uh, everyone who follows Cuba closely, all books like this are very important because we don't think that uh, we talk enough about Cuba. Um, and so these will definitely help to, to know better Osvaldo Paya and the incredible initiative that he, uh, he did. Uh, my question is, um, Writing your book, uh, did you think uh, or uh, what the international community could do to not arrive to that point? And I'm asking because today, while we are here, there are there is uh, one activist six days in hunger strike and thirst strike in Geneva to ask uh, just uh, a declaration, a statement uh, of Bachelet on the case of his sister. We have another activist six days uh, without eating and drinking uh, in jail. And, uh, and then uh, we have uh, one of the prisoners of La Primavera Negra that we don't know anything about from him for a month. And so 20 years uh, or 10 years from uh, the incident after, what can we do more to not have another Osvaldo Paya and then another book in 10 years? Thanks. That's a tough question. And I want to uh, say uh, Milena Vasquez was my researcher here. And she's come from Florida and sitting in the front row. I'm going to give her the mic and ask her to answer. <laughs> no, no, I won't ask it. <laughs> I wish I knew that. We, we're puzzled because it's a tough question. You know, many people in um, 1980, 85 would have said, the Soviet Union's been around for 70 years, it's gonna be here for another 100. Why did it suddenly come apart? Why did the Berlin Wall come down? Why did solidarity win in the fight against Polish communism? I, I don't think there's like an easy formula. But one thing that is true is that when governments lose that connection to the people completely, and believe me, uh, Castro's revolution, not unlike the Bolshevik revolution, was based on ideals, utopia. Uh, 
was based on things that people actually did believe in for a while. But they don't believe anymore. And I think that the most optimistic thing I can say about Cuba, about lines for bread and for ch potatoes, about people saying there's not even any aspirin on this island that supposedly has such a great health care system, the most optimistic thing you can possibly say is it's beset with stagnation. And I don't know how long people can tolerate that. And I thought last year's protest was the beginning of a crack. But I can't give you a timeline, or a how, or a when. So Melania doesn't want to answer. <laughs> okay. Ma'am, go ahead. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, my question goes uh, around if you see someone carrying the torch of the Project Varela in Cuba. Uh, I was also hoping for this uh, demonstrations last year. But now you have uh, hundreds of people sentenced to five and ten years of prison just for or singing a song and asking for liberty. So is there any one that you see or uh, like carrying the torch of a project like that uh, in uh, Cuba? Uh, maybe, uh, you know, demanding something in the near future or do we have to, s to wait? Because uh, I'm from Mexico, so uh, in Latin America we used to expect that when Fidel Castro died, that would be the end. And then Raul Castro, when he would die of or, or pass the, the government, something would come up. And uh, years come and go and uh, nothing yes, happens. That's yeah. true. Uh, it sometimes seems rather hopeless. Mm -hmm. But I would answer your question this way. There is not a, a Gorbachev on the scene. I don't think this change is coming from the top. But you ask who might lead it, there are more than a 720 people in prison today just for going on the streets last July 11th. And if you extrapolate that, how many family members do they have? How many thousands of people have, including young people, some of them were minors, under 16 years old, are in prison just for one day speaking their mind? I think somewhere in that horrible situation of all these 700 people, there's a leader, and there's a future. And the stagnation and the anger that still is there from this might lead to change. Yes, yes, ma'am, please. Hi. I have a comment and a question. When President Obama opened travel to Cuba, what was what is your opinion about that? Was it truly significant? Was there a possibility of it becoming something really uh, significant to broaden the possibility for the people to want to ask for liberation? Obama's opening was very late in his presidency. And unfortunately, it was too short-lived. To change someplace by engagement means you have to kind of flood the zone. You have to do a lot more than just a year or two of openness. And that's all it was. Yeah. It was cut short. Mm -hmm. I don't think the idea was wrong. I actually think engagement is a powerful tool, but it's soft power, and it takes time. And there wasn't enough time. And frankly, I also think if you look at what happened after that, right, shutting everything down um, hasn't brought us results either, right? We didn't somehow starve the, the Cuban regime out of business in the Trump years either. And it goes back to what I said before, that this is not an American U.S. policy issue. It's an issue for the people of Cuba. And they are beginning, I think, to realize that. David, I think that's a very important point. I think two points about democratic change. It comes where you least expect it. Uh, I think I said that. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, th I, I think that it comes where you least expect it and often by people who have not been supported or paid attention to. I think about the revolution several years ago in Sudan, which has sadly been kind of sidetracked, but that came out of the blue and not for, with a lot of support from the outside. And they but people were fed up. Right? People were fed up the with the dictatorship of there. Stagnation and fed up. Right. Yeah. Exactly. And then, by the way, you're seeing what's happening in Sri Lanka today, where I have one more quick Please. comment. 
by whatever, fate or whatever. In 2019, when they started talking about the coronavirus, this, that, and the other, I had decided to go to Florida to relocate because I was this tired of the 30 plus years of living in DC. I ended up in Miami in December of 2019 when they had just uh, opened up seven or eight daily flights to Cuba. And I had to quarantine there and I got to see the Cuban people of Miami taking tons of, of materials, goods, clothing, shoes, television, whatever they could take back and forth. And uh, that lasted a couple of weeks and then they discontinued the flights into Cuba and back and forth. So I got to see what the people living here in America were trying to, to do to assist with that situation. Thank you. Yes, sir. Hi, I just want to thank you for writing this book. I'm only halfway through, so I'm not all the way through like you, sir. Um, so uh, one thing that struck me is you spent the first half, at least a good portion of the first half of the book, uh, writing about the 1940 uh, Constitution, uh, you know, the history that went into the Constitution, and then its eventual demise. Uh, when you started this project, was it your intent to write, you know, a brief history of the Constitution, or is that something that just came about looking to play out his life? No, I, because I asked myself, okay, this guy went out and collected signatures, big deal. Like, what, you know, what was the context of that? And I realized that it was a dictatorship, so it was maybe a big, bigger deal than here when you collect signatures to fix a street or something. But I also wanted to understand why did he come up with this idea? I mean, you could also have painted graffiti on 10 walls or done a bunch of other things. But what I discovered is twice before, people had tried to use this and the, uh, the legacy of it had sort of filtered down that there was this little provision in that constitution that allowed you to collect signatures to get a law, to get a law approved, to get change. And the people who tried it previously had always been rolled up by Castro's secret police. So I wanted to know how did that provision get in the law if Oswaldo Paya's genius was to use the rules of the state against itself, where did those rules come from? And as often happens in a research project, you wanted to know what happened, and then you wanted to know what happened before that, and before that, and I kept stepping yeah. backwards. And Elena was my main researcher on the history of the Constitution. And if you go to my website, there is a report that she wrote for the book, a research report on the history of the Constitution, which will tell you everything. There's, we actually have the transcript of the entire Constitutional Convention. Oh. Um, that you can read to see the debates. And people th think of Cuba, they think of Fidel Castro and the bearded guy and the, the cigar, right? And that's all they think of. It, Castro has sucked all the oxygen out of the Cuba story. But the truth is that Cuba was a republic yeah. from 1902 to 1952. And what happened in that republic was that people did struggle for a democratic system. It, you know, it was the last colony Spain had in the New World. To, they wanted to build one. It was very difficult. There was a, they oftentimes failed. But that 1940 Constitution was the pinnacle of their, of their effort and their success. There is a Cuba story that's not about Castro that's important. That's why I, I put it in there. Plus, I had the terrific yeah. report well, from th Thank you both. Yeah. <laughs> David, we're just about out of time. I don't see uh, any other questions, so I'm just going to ask a final question. First of all, uh, thank you for a great overview of the book, and I, again, congratulations on a magnificent accomplishment. Thanks for I, doing this. And it, I wanted to ask you, one, if there's anything you wanted to say you haven't had a chance to say, but I also think it would be interesting to me, and you touched upon this a little bit when you're talking about the Stasi, but you spend so much of your time in your career focused on Russia, the Soviet Union. I think three of your books had to do with with that part of the world. Uh, was there anything, in, as you dove into Cuba, that either uh, was sort of made you think, hey, this is like what I studied before, or something that was different? You know, what we, give a little sense of the comparative perspective that you, uh, that you came away with. 
One of my earlier books was about nuclear weapons, and in researching it, uh, I was looking at the history of Soviet nuclear weapons. And on that research trip, I went to the house in, outside of Nizhny Novgorod where Andrei Sakharov wrote one of his great declarations. And I spent some time researching and thinking about Sakharov and how does a physicist who was high up in the Soviet system become a dissident and turn against such a powerful state. And remember, Sakharov came from the elite. He had, all, he had top secret clearances. How did and why did he do that? And one of the things I saw in Oswaldo Payaz's story was the same train of thought that had brought Sakharov around. And Oswaldo, I tried desperately to find out where did he get that train of thought. I actually had a photograph of his bookshelf. I looked at every single book on his bookshelf. I couldn't find the answer in the books because he found the answer on the streets of Cuba in the same way that Sakharov had. And Oswaldo was a devout Catholic, and he had an idea that I find absolutely incontrovertible. And that idea was people have a right to rights and those rights are bestowed on us as humans by God and not by Fidel Castro or a dictator. And I think that applies to everybody fighting for those rights today in Ukraine and Belarus, in Cuba and Myanmar, in Egypt and everywhere else. And this particular idea grew out of his faith, but ultimately he saw his faith as a window and a pathway to some kind of liberty, to something that we would call democracy and free speech and freedom, rather than simply a spiritual. And that is unique, but it's also very useful. And I think it's incontrovertible. David, that's a very inspiring note to end the talk on. So thank you for a great talk. Great to be with you, and good luck on the book thank sales. Thank you for doing it. Great. Yeah, thank you both very much, David and Mike.